overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. Economically viable, the podcast slash vodcast of post post postmodern madness and societal decay. By now, we've all heard the term toxic masculinity thousands upon thousands of times. But what about the flip side of the equation? Is there such a thing as toxic feminism? And if so, how come the media and academia are so loath to address it as an equally corrosive and destructive social construct? Well, to answer that question for us, we reached out to veteran Irish reporter and author Geraldine Comiskey to outline what is and what isn't toxic feminism, and how it permeates all aspects of society, with especially deleterious effects on women themselves. And with that in mind, how about we throw it to Geraldine and get the discussion going, why don't we? All right, welcome everybody once again to another installment of Not Economically Viable, the podcast slash vodcast of post postmodern madness and societal decline, all the fun stuff in the world. Today we're going to be taking a look at the topic of feminism. No, not F-E-M-I-N-I-S-M feminism. Feminism. F-E-M-M-E. And who better to talk about the subject than the great Irish reporter Geraldine Comiskey, who's written several books on the topic of floozies. So we're going to talk to her about what floozies are, uh, her definition of toxic femininity, and take a look at some of the more overlapping issues of being a female reporter working in the UK these days. So, Geraldine, I'll just throw it to you and allow you to introduce yourself. Just give us a quick overview of who you are, your reporting career, and some of the books you've written. Yeah, James, well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist for more than 30 years, here, here, mostly based here in Ireland. I've done a little bit of travelling, but I've been mostly based in, in Dublin in Ireland. And um, I've, I've done all kinds of journalism, really, but I find that if you're a female journalist, you kind of get pigeonholed. Either you're very serious or you're a light-hearted kind of floozy type bimbo journalist, which I found anyway. And I, I've, a lot of my stories I've done in the last few years have been these Our Girl, Our Girl features where they send me out to take part in something and I have to get my picture taken with it. And I, I've always kind of said, OK, I'll, I'll do it because... I, I, you know, you take any all the work you can get, but you, you get a certain a certain image then, and people p- pigeonhole you that w- in that w- with that sort of image, and you can't get serious work as a journalist. I find it, no matter how many court reports I did in the past, no matter how many investigative pieces I did, I'm always going to be branded a, a light, a light, a lightweight, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, there's uh, several books you've written, fictitious, non-fictitious, essays, collection of articles. Uh, is there a sort of an overlapping theme to the things you write about? Um, yeah, I suppose they, they, well, they have been aimed at women, but I find men like them as well. But they've been aimed at women who um, who basically are um, either looking for a romance or avoiding romance, or they're, they're trying to change their image, or they're trying to reinvent themselves. So I suppose that, that's the overlapping theme in, in the books. And I have so many questions uh, about people who report in the UK specifically, because over here in the US, of course, you have the first... Well, it's not really the UK anymore, but we're Ireland, but I mean, um, I, you know, we might end up becoming part of the UK, but we're part of the European Union at the moment, <laughs> which is kind of, um, the, the UK is, we, part of Ireland is in the UK, but this part isn't. Uh, so you're free Ireland. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the south, southern part of Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, it's always interesting. I, do, I just thought I, I don't expect you to know. I don't expect people in America to be be that, be that um, interested in it because it's you know it's obviously a small country, but only one part of Ireland is in the UK. Hey, well, you are my ancestral homeland, so I always feel. Yeah, to be honest, which I prefer to be part of the UK than the EU, but that's another that's another topic that I get a lot of flack for. <laughs> Yeah, and it's always interesting speaking to you know reporters from you know not just the UK, but really Europe in general, just about you know what you're allowed to cover because you don't have the same legal safeguards that we have in the US, uh, yeah. specifically in terms of libel. So what's it like working under you know that lack of security net? Well, I think I, I think it's security for some people though. You know, I mean, I, you, you can't say what you like about someone and damage their reputation here w- without proving that that you, you know you, you have to have all the proof before you. You say something about someone, so it is. It's good in some ways, and it can, of course, be used. I mean, if you don't have the proof, but you know something, I mean, obviously, you have to be very careful what you say here. 
So it has good and bad sides. And on balance, I think it's not a bad thing to have to have defamation law. But the problem is you have to you, you have to be fairly wealthy to sue somebody if they do defame you. So the, and the other thing is they changed they they moved the goalposts. It used to be you had six years to sue. Now you only have one year. So I I've been defamed and I, I can't sue the people who defamed me because I, I I didn't have time and I was too busy working to to actually do anything about it. But you know you can really destroy somebody's reputation by by by, by defaming them without proof. So. I don't think, I mean, a lot of the stuff that's, that's said about Donald Trump o- over in America, um, they are saying it over here, but technically he could sue them. Uh, he could sue people in Ireland and Britain for, for, um, for some of the stuff they're saying because they haven't got proof. Yeah, been moving along. I checked out your book movies <laughs> earlier. Fantastic read. I'm not really a big fan of nonfiction, so if I enjoyed it, then it's a really good book. It really that's great. No, I find I actually find men seem to. I mean, I know, and I shouldn't pigeonhole people because I know we're all individuals, but I have found men enjoyed floozies a lot, and um, I, more than I thought they would actually, because <laughs> it was aimed at women. It's one of those things where you know a lot of times you have difficulty relating to characters fictitious in nature of a different gender, but this character, the main character in that book, I really felt an affinity towards. I can really relate to her experiences. Oh, that's so, great, yeah. So that's a great job there. And there's a very, very interesting quote you have in that book, which kind of sets the pace for the entire interview. Uh, the quote is, The battle of the sexes has been replaced by a civil war among women and floozies are the underdogs. So pretty much the rest of the interview will be kind of dissecting that particular statement. So just to begin, when someone says the word floozy, what immediately comes to mind for you? Well, I, I'm a woman of a certain age, because I know young people, young people who are, who, who would fit this description would be called charts, you know, or airheads. Um, but old, it's, it's generally a middle-aged woman. Or you'd be called a tartarus a lot if you were a young person you behaved in this way. But it's usually a, a, an older, promiscuous woman or a woman is perceived to be promiscuous. She mightn't even be promiscuous, but she just could be perceived to be because of the way she dresses and maybe she's a bit flirtatious. And I find it's generally older people, like middle-aged people and older people who, who call other women floozies. And it's generally women who say it. But, um, the, the, it's, it, you have to be, I think you have to be over 40. I mean, when I, when I wrote this book first, I showed it to a literary agent. He said, make her 40, because 40, I was going to make her 45. And he said, oh, no, a 45-year-old woman um, wouldn't, wouldn't be um, attractive enough. Um, to fit, you know, she would, she would have started to lose her looks a lot at that point. And I said, oh, God, that's great. It's brilliant now. Um, that's, that, that, that really shows the attitude towards women of a certain age. But um, anyway, I did. I took his advice, and I, I, I moved her down to 40. But, so she has to be at least 40, but I actually think older, but anyway. I, I, and 40 seems to be the age that most people decide someone is a floozy. Now, floozy, it's an interesting word because it kind of has sort of a transatlantic meaning where I think in the UK, Ireland, and even in the US, it kind of has the same connotation. So in what yeah. ways does a floozy differ, you know, in an etymological sense from terms like a hussy or a bimbo? Well, a hussy is a much milder term. I mean, a hussy, you could say hussy in a joking way, and you could say, oh, you brazen hussy. And it could mean like you're a little bit of a flirt. You know, you're, it's a bit someone who's a bit cheeky. But a floozy is more of an insult. I mean, to call someone a floozy, uh, oh, that old floozy, it, it's basically it's ageism mixed in with sexism, I think, whereas a hussy can be a young person as well. And it, it's very harmless, you know. I, I mean, being called a hussy is actually quite funny, you know, it's, but floozy is, is really insulting. And when you look at the media, there are plenty of depictions of floozies in popular culture. I mean, obviously you have Blanche Devereaux on Golden Girls, you have Bridget Jones. Yeah. So what does Hollywood and the media at large get right and get wrong about the floozy stereotype? Well, I think Hollywood, um, they, they kind of pigeonhole floozies as, as um, either really bad ones or, or very likable ones. And they make the same. Well, I mean, Hollywood's not really making a mistake in this because they're, they're only reflecting what people actually think. But Bridget Jones is the kind of likable floozy. And she's likable because she doesn't seem like a threat to other women. She's really, I mean, a lot of women would identify with her. I mean, they'd, they'd be happy to identify with her because she's not out to get anyone else's man. She's just a desperate single woman. She really wants to find Mr. Wright, but she will sleep with a variety of men on occasions. So, I mean, she sleeps with a really, um, with the Hugh Grant character, who's completely, he'd be a male floozy, I suppose, but men, never, men are never called that. But she sleeps with this man who's basically a, a male slut. Uh, and then she, um, you know, and she steals her boyfriend back from another woman. But she's not, she's not I wouldn't call her a floozy, but a lot of people would. And um, the Golden Girls, um, they're funny old tarty women, well, you know, especially the, the really tarty one. But they're kind of lovable but because, again, they're not really a threat. And they're, they're so old that they're, as my agent, my literary agent would have said, that they wouldn't be attractive enough to be, to be the main character of that book I was writing. 
But um, I think my sluzies are sluttier. <laughs> They're slutty. So, so, in so um, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, the, the other types of floozies in Hollywood would be um, Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction. She'd be the, the more extreme version, you know. Um, she's nasty, aggressive, catty, and hates the sisterhood. And she really, she, she comes up against another woman and she, she turns against a man when he rejects her. She would be an extreme version. And then Blanche Dubois in a, in a streetcar named Desire would, would be kind of one of the extreme floozies. But they, they're kind of rejected by women. I, you know, people say floozies reject other women, but I think the sisterhood rejects the floozies, really. They're re rejected by respectable society in general because they're either too attractive to men or they think they're too attractive. You know, some of them are deluded. But men are kind of ashamed to know them and, and women are outraged by them. They're outsiders, but, but they're not outsiders by choice, I think. You know, that, that's what I, I believe. Yeah, and in general terms, you know, U.S. society, European society, you know, what have you, for whatever reason, the term floozy generally doesn't have a positive connotation. But it seems like with your work, you're on the path of trying to make it sort of a reclaimed term and a positive self-identifier. So why should the term floozy be something that women embrace as, you know, a fitting term? Well, I think I, I think it's kind of like one of those words. I, I mean, I, I, I'm i not sure if they should reclaim it, but the characters in my book believe it because I, I got into, when I started writing this, I kind of wrote it for fun. Then it started, I know my own views came into it as well, but it's really the characters in my book that believe this. I don't personally, I don't know if they should be, if they should be proud of it at all. It's like, it's like maybe they should in a way that, you know, the way gay people have reclaimed the word queer, for example, but nobody else can call them that. Maybe they, maybe every 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 insult should be reclaimed. But you know, um, and the way some some people reclaim the term bad bad now means cool. Michael Jackson might have started all that, but but um, the term floozies, if 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 it is reclaimed, I, I don't see the harm in it. But I, I don't particularly. Um, I'm not I'm not campaigning for it. But um, if it is, why not? You know. I mean, if it gets rid of some some po face prejudice uh, that people have, you know, people have people have prejudices against people for all sorts of irrational reasons and if it if it kind of deals with some of that and some of the hypocrisy and if, if i reclaim the term floozy it, it puts some of these hip hypocritical people in their place i think it would be a good thing and one of the really interesting topics your book brings up and a lot of your work touches on this issue is the idea of feminism versus feminism and you kind of yeah. touched on this earlier we're talking about the general you know society of women sort of shunning the floozies so yeah. what is the difference between feminism and F E M M E in feminism. Well, the, the feminism is kind of well, it could be good or bad, but 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 it's kind of a toxic, fake feminism, which which is um, where women they they're deliberately nasty to women who don't fit into their idea of, of what a woman should be, and they're kind of enraged by these women who who flirt or with men or who dress in such a way as what the feminists call the male gaze. They they, they have to appeal to the male gaze. This is, they, they, these are the women who protest beauty pageants. They don't, they don't like women dressing up to appeal to men, basically. They don't like chivalry, and they, they regard chivalry as a man opening a door for a woman as an insult. Um, whereas whereas um, feminism, as in femme fatale sort of feminism, that, that's the kind of feminism that, that celebrates being, being a woman and, and, and looking like a woman, and even if it means flirting with men and even having a power over men. Some of, them, some of the floozies in my book believe they have a power over men. And that's, that's, that's the feminism. And the, basically, these are femme, femme fatales who've, who've reclaimed the femme part of it, I think. Yeah. And so they don't really hate being... They, they don't believe they have to act like men, and they don't believe men should stop acting like men, whereas the, the, the other type of feminists do seem to believe that men should, should basically not, not regard women as different and we should all be equal. And to be honest, we're not equal, and, and the difference is one of the good things about, about being men and women, I think. And do you use the terms fake feminism and toxic feminism interchangeably, or are yeah. there some slight differences? Well, they are interchangeable most of the time, but I think toxic feminists are deliberately nasty, and I think the fake feminists, maybe they're well-meaning. You know, they, they campaign for gender quotas, for example, in, in, in business, and they, they mean well. I mean, it's, it's actually counterproductive, I think, because then you have token women, um, you know, people will say about women who get jobs. Um, or get you know say half the board in, in a company is, is female because they've taken on women to comply with a gender quota the people will say oh she only got that because she's a woman this is what the fake feminists have been campaigning for but, but it's backfired on them uh, but they, they are well-meaning and they, they also campaign against things like um you know barbie doll images of women in magazines and they mean well but ironically there's often a picture of of, of, a, of a naked or a semi-naked woman beside the article they're writing where they're campaigning against these glamorous pictures 
and they they're they're, they're kind of uh, they're, they're telling women that you, you cannot look like this uh, and be a woman then so what where does that leave women who actually do look after their figures and are attractive and or want to be attractive it means you, you know unless you're going around with hairy legs or you know you know letting yourself go and not plucking your eyebrows or whatever you're, you're not a proper feminist this, this is what the fake feminists have done but but um the, the toxic feminists um it's, it's not like it's, it's more deliberate it's, it's definitely they want to change the idea of what a woman is they, they want us to be they want us to stop appealing to men altogether they seem to they're the old-fashioned man hating feminists but they're kind of rebranded i think you know as, as modern feminists and can you give us perhaps an example of toxic femininity and fake feminism in the media industry? Yeah, well, I think the the toxic feminism is 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 the kind where they you know they, they they're attacking women now for every they're they're attacking women for for example, uh, uh, like pictures of women who are slim, for example, in in, in magazines and newspapers. They say they're not real women. This is toxic feminism because they're they're basically saying that to, to be a woman you should accept that. Um, Oh, it's like all body types are acceptable except the sort, the sort that becomes a model. Whereas, and the fake feminism, they, they're more likely to campaign for gender quotas, and they might, they might, you know, say uh, be more inclusive. All, all women are beautiful, and um, men should should share the housework, and you know, which it's very reasonable. The, the fake feminism, they, but they, but they believe that men should be equal to women, and I know why they believe, and I can, I can sort of see their point of view. But the toxic feminists really hate men, basically, and they hate anything that would appeal to the male gaze, as they call it. So they want to get rid of, um, you know. The, the male idea of what a woman should be and you know it all sounds very academic but but you, you notice it when you read articles by them you notice that that, that they, they basically want to change women's own uh, well they want to change they don't want women to be traditional in any way and, and say women for example women who want to want to work at home minding their children they regard them as letting down the sisterhood this is what the toxic families do and you would read articles occasionally um like that and what are some of the signs and symptoms of the toxic feminists? What are the warning signs we should look for when we're reading articles or op-eds? Um, well, when you see a term such as the male gaze, I, when I see that, the male gaze, um, that, that, I, that, that, that raises a red flag because I know I'm reading something by a toxic feminist then. Whereas if I see something just saying, um, you know, men and women should have equal pay, I'm just saying, okay, that, that, that might be a genuine a, a genuine um, feminist, or even a man could say that, but it could be, it, she could also be campaigning for gender quotas, which I think is fake feminism, because I think it's counterproductive, but it's not necessarily toxic, but a toxic feminism, talk about the male gaze, they talk about, about, um, you know, they, they, t they talk about women, um, oh yeah, the patriarchy, that's another thing they call, they, they say men are all part of the patriarchy, which I think is ridiculous, I mean, I think women have always been powerful, and especially where I am in Ireland, I mean, Celtic women, they, they were they were the bosses, They you know, they were the leaders, Always, and I, I don't. And even you look back in even in history, and there were, there were always great queens, and there, going back to Roman times, and there was Cleopatra in Egypt. So I, I don't believe I don't buy what they're saying that men have had all this power for years. Women have always had power. They might have been too busy doing other things to, to claim that power, but I don't I don't believe that women have always been the underdogs. And they seem they're kind of leading a war against men as, as if we have to overturn um, years of male domination. Actually, women have been the bosses, and I, as anyone who's ever being a mother or a granny will know women are the bosses everywhere. And, and that's not, I'm not even saying that as a feminist, I'm just saying that as a woman. And when you look at the issue of this woman on woman misogyny, how does it compare to the prevalence of the traditional male on female misogyny, particularly, you know, in the news media? Um, I think I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I'd love to see somebody do a scientific survey on it, but I think it's about I, I think the men certain men enable women to to be misogynist, and certain women enable men to be misogynist. Um, the women and women, uh, the female misogynists are basically I, at the back of it all. They're very competitive women. You know, they, they 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 pretend to be for the sisterhood for for women, but they're basically queen bees, and they want to be surrounded by drones, and they do everything they can to keep other women down while pretending to be on their side. I mean, if they 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 if, if they if they allow another woman to rise up through the ranks and work with them, it's usually a woman who's not a threat to them. Uh, and the same with the men around them, but the men are kind of helping them then, because the men, the, 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 these men who who use women like floozies, for example, and then discard them, so like, like say the the the, um, the Weinstein thing, you know, he 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 kind of used men, he he used women and and discarded them, and there was, it, were loads of women were complicit in this as well. Well, it's the same thing that happens in 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 work where where these queen bees are are surrounded by drones for men who kind of 
you know, they, they'll write some, they'll describe some other woman as an airhead or a bimbo and a lightweight. And, you know, she'll never rise up the ranks. Whereas the, the, the women who, who were more in keeping with what, what they, they would regard as their little uh, sort of, they'd be like their drones, their female drones and their male drones. They, they won't have any trouble um, doing well. But, but, but I, I find that, 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 that it really is competitive women, queen bees who want to be surrounded by, by worker bees. And these are the female misogynists, and that's really what's at the back of it all. And the male misogynists are happy to go along with this because they can they can use and abuse these other women who they, everyone just calls them, everyone dumps on these these bluesies, these women who who maybe they're not married or they're married and they're they're just a little bit charty. Everyone jumps on them, and they they write them off and based on their appearance or based on the fact that they they don't they don't particularly want to go around with this masculine appearance, you know. And in what ways, socially and professionally, does toxic feminism hurt women? Um, well, it, well, it turns women against each other. I think it 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 it, it make it, it divides women into two types. And if you're unlucky enough to, to fit into one type, you can't you can't cross over. You know, it, it divides you. You're you're either a serious woman or you're or you're a charge, basically. So I think that's what it does. And and it, it creates a bystander effect where everyone's afraid to be on the side of of the outcast who's the floozy. Because if they do, they're kind of letting down women. You know, there's, I mean, say this this woman who goes around wearing mini skirts and um, I don't know, like skin tight clothes and low cut tops. There, a lot of women will will look down on her and say, "Oh, look at her. She's looking for attention." And she mightn't be. It might just be the way she happens to want to dress at that time. You know, maybe you know. Whereas, whereas if they, they'll write her off then and uh, turn other women against her as well as men. So uh, I, I just think it's I I don't I, I don't know why they're so obsessed with the way women look, but I keep seeing these articles all the time and I keep hearing it in daily life where where, where people women are attacked for for looking a certain way, and it, it actually you can get away with you can get away with dressing like a tart if you actually don't look well, but if you, if you are, if you happen to actually look well in the clothes, I've I've seen it time and time again. I've seen models being attacked just because they they happen to be to happen to look like like models basically. So if if they Maybe if they put on a few pounds in the wrong places, they, you know, they, they, they um, or, or if they didn't do their hair or something, maybe women wouldn't hate them so much. And what are some of the impacts of toxic feminism on men? Well, it, it appeals to a certain type of man, definitely, because I mean, this is the man who was maybe married to this, married to Mrs. Plain, and she got he 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 can date Miss Floozy on 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 the side. And they, you know, no one look, no one, everyone will say, oh, she led him astray. She's a floozy after all. I mean, it's not his fault. He's only an innocent man. Whereas these horrible floozies, they're always looking for men. They, they want everyone's man. This is what they'll say about about these women. And do you think there's any sort of end game to toxic feminism? You know, what exactly would they want in terms of you know social policies or legislation? Yeah, I, well, I just think they hate. I, I don't even think there's there's much. Well, I, I do think they want to be the boss, you know, but I, I, I think that this hatred towards other women, they're looking for scapegoats, really. And they, they, they want to distance themselves from these other women. Who, maybe they genuinely feel these, uh, these other women are letting them down because, I mean, by their own... I, I mean, I don't think they set out to be to be hypocritical. Obviously, nobody does, but they... Um, they I, I don't know if, it, if, 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 it, if they thought it out enough, really. But there are, and there are some, in fairness, there are some feminists who, are, who, who, who don't judge women on the way they dress, but... They, you know, even even recently, um, there, there was a case where a male journalist over here, a male broadcaster, made a comment about rape, and he and he basically was saying that he gave some advice out to women. He just said, well, "Why why would a, a young woman go go to a hotel room with a man she doesn't know?" And they, uh, he was accused of 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 being on the side of the rapist, and he wasn't. And feminists were attacking him, saying women should be allowed to dress whatever they, way they want and do what they like. And, and I mean, I agree with them, but at the same time, I, I you know, they, they turned it on his head, and they, it became a ridiculous argument where they were saying women, you know, they, they, they were, you know, you would think that these women would be on the side of so-called floozies, but they weren't. What they were doing was saying that women should be allowed, men should not basically be attracted to women. And if they are, um, and if the woman suddenly changes her mind, it's rape. Whereas, so a big controversy started over that, and, and I, I can see, I can see the arguments that the women were making. I can also see the argument he was making was that everyone is responsible for themselves. You know, even though, even though it's obviously not not a woman's fault that she was raped, it is it is partly her responsibility to ensure that that she be safe. And it's also a man's responsibility. But a friend of mine was saying to me that, you know, there's this image that, that's been portrayed of men that they're uncontrollable. And women seem to, it's the feminists are pushing this, that men can't control themselves and that, that when they see a woman, they can't help but rape her if she's dressed a certain way. And it's, it's actually the feminists who are pushing this all the time.
they, they call it rape culture and, and they say men seem to have modern men basically can't control themselves so they're bla- they want to blame the men all the time whereas you know other people want to blame the woman but I don't blame either side I blame I, I blame the people who rape for rape and I also believe that everyone should take care of their own personal security and, in and if, that means, if that means dressing in baggy clothes when you're going out at night yeah absolutely it doesn't mean you're pandering it doesn't mean you're pandering to either the, 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 the toxic feminists or the rape culture and in what way would you say that toxic feminism has impacted Irish society the most over the last, uh, let's say, 10 or 15 years? Um, well, I think it's, it's kind of worldwide, really, but it, it, it's just been uh, this, this idea that it's basically the idea that we, we, can't, we can't be two kinds of women. We can't be a woman who appeals to men because um, we're letting down women. That, that's, that's, I, we, they're somehow bet- we're somehow betraying women if we, if we like to appeal to men, if we like to be attractive. Um, if, if, if you know, we, we either appeal to men or we appeal to women, but we don't appeal to both. And that, I just think it's weird, you know, that it's it's kind of a, it's it's an idea that we have to that we have to fit into the idea that they have of women, which is which is a very bland image of women, basically. You know, sort of. I, I don't know, I'd imagine that I, I'm just I, this is just I mean I, this is a work of fiction, so I I was I, I was making these women kind of think this out for me because I, I hadn't got strong views on, on it until I wrote the book but I, I'd imagine that um, the toxic feminist would like every woman to go around looking like Hillary Clinton in her trouser suit and not looking like say um, um, the Playboy bunnies for example and have you experienced any you know setbacks in your career you know for being against the toxic feminist zeitgeist um, I think I have but I mean I, 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 I kind of I've been too busy working to really think about it and I have I, I you know I've been doing well over the years but so I, I, I can't say that it's, it's actually I, I do I do find you get pigeonholed but it, it's worked out fine for me because I, I, I wrote these articles where I had to get my picture taken with them and I, I suppose that it, it didn't do me much harm as much harm unless if I wanted to go into serious journalism go back into it it would be hard, hard to get back into it I find you know because people have said to me okay um, you're sending a CV out to new editors kind of play down the, the stuff you've done where you had photographs taken with what you're writing and try and find try and use the old articles where you which were more serious so i i you know people have, no, have said that that's where it's impacted on me uh but I, I i i'm not going to go into specifics because i i could i could be sued if i can't prove it but i i i find in general um that yeah i mean this is, i've been against some of the, some of the feminist ideas too such as gender quotas and i'd have arguments with people about that but i don't know if that impacts on my career i'm also I'm also pro-life. I don't believe abortion is, is right. I believe it's murder, but um, a lot of feminists believe it is right and they believe it's a feminist issue. And I actually point out to them that a lot of the, the victims of abortion are actually little girls, baby girls. And when, when you point that out, you're immediately la- labelled not just um, anti-feminist, you're also labelled right-wing and all these things. So um, I can't understand that these people are against the death sentence and yet they don't they believe in the death sentence towards women and i most of the most of the most of the victims of abortion are young women and unborn girls because in a lot of cultures all around the world people don't want girls they want sons they don't want daughters so so i keep pointing out that's a feminist issue but uh, in a different way whereas they're regarding as a woman has a right to do whatever she wants with her body and i can see their point but i don't think i, I think there's another person involved in abortion so it has affected me regarding abortion and it might have affected me in other ways, but it probably in a positive way because I got loads of work playing up the, the bimbo <laughs> image. <laughs> and do you have any tips for coexisting with toxic feminists? It seems like it's an ideology. It's not going to be a uh, sort of backtrack anytime in our lifetime. Yeah, I, well, I find uh, don't I, I don't let it bother me. I find um, you know have a laugh at them really, you know, because there are plenty of people who know what they are, know they're toxic. And um, you know, plenty of, there are plenty of fem, fam, like fam fatalists, and there are plenty of women who um, who would be more like the women in my books, really. But um, so, so we can have a laugh at these other women, I suppose, and, and we can agree with them on some things and not agree with them others. So I, I wouldn't sweat it, you know. I, I, I think you, you have to kind of. I, I think you're dealt. You have to. You have to. You have to work with the cards you're dealt, and you can't. You can't really fight it, you know. If you find yourself pigeonholed. For whatever reason, you know, you, you just use that in your career and, and, and work with it. But, fight, you know, point it out to them by all means and have arguments with them. And But the, I find you have arguments with these, these fake feminists. They, they're almost foaming at the mouth when you're arguing with them. They get quite angry. They, they have very, very firm views. They have very, very fixed views of, of what feminism is. And whereas my, my view is more, 
I, I, I might change my opinion more, say I'm used to writing from different points of views. I'm, I'm used to interviewing people and seeing different angles, whereas these people aren't. I think they, they, they have a very fixed, rigid idea of, of what, of what of the way a woman should think and the way a woman should dress. And in uh, U.S. media studies in particular, there's a term called intersectionality, which has come in vogue over the last couple of years. Uh, and I yeah. think that might apply also to this issue of toxic feminism. That there are several sort of sub-issues to this that also kind of come into play. I want to kind of discuss a few of the things that you write quite frequently about, uh, beginning with the concept of ageism. You know, what exactly is this, and how does it negatively impact women in the workplace? Well, I think ageism, I, I, um, I, it, you, I'm surprised that feminists really, that they can be so ageist, but they are. But ageism is, um, it comes across all the time towards women because they, they say, for example, it's okay for a woman to be a bit tarty if she's young and she's only, she's only um, like, finding herself. But if, if you're an older woman and, and you're, you're, you're kind of a flirt or you're wearing, like, low-cut tops or something, they, they say, oh, this, uh, the state of her at her age, um, and... You know, they kind of they they find they find you find that an elderly an elderly single woman with no children is the most hated person in society. I find you know, I mean, you hear you even hear of people going to funerals and they talk about someone who died and say, "Oh, look, she was only a young woman, or he was only a young man, and he had children, he had five children, or whatever, or he had his whole life ahead of him." And um, but if they ha if, you know, if if you're a young man, especially, or even a young woman, it's it's it's, oh, it's kind of tragic if you die. But if you're an old single woman, it's it's the worst thing you can be, really, because they say like, so what what use was you to the world? And you you get men going to there's a matchmaking festival every year in Ireland called the Lisbon Barn Matchmaking Festival. It's great fun, but um, you get you you get these men who are kind of a bit they're they're a bit belligerent. They feel like. That what are all these women going around single? Why aren't they? Why aren't they hooked up with men? There, there are men looking for women, and these awful women are going around hanging on to their independence. The bloody cheek of them is the attitude they seem to have, you know. And so, especially an older woman, it's, why would an older woman? What would she be doing with her life? You know, why, why doesn't she have, you know, grandchildren at this stage? And um, you know, at least a young woman would have potential. But they, they look, they regard an old woman as somebody who the only use for the only possible use for her is to kind of marry some man and look after him in his old age. And how does the topic of inverted racism tie back into toxic feminism? Well, it's, uh, it, it, well what it has in common with, fem with the toxic feminism is that it's all it's hypocrisy. And I find the same kind of people. They're, they're generally politi they're all politically correct. Political correctness is a common link, really. And um, they, they, they're toxic, the, the, the toxic feminists and the inverted racists and inverted snobs as well, they all tend to have this idea that... Um, you know, the, the, if you are somehow privileged, say say you're white, for example, uh, in I mean I don't know why they why you, they would be like that in Ireland because we've never really, we, you know, we've never really had a culture where we, we had different races until recently. So I, I don't understand why, why there's no such thing as white privilege here. We've always had poor white people and wealthy white people, but I, I mean racism itself is ridiculous. But they they have this idea that um, if you're a white person and you're uh, you know you you're, you're privileged. Um, and that's kind of inverted racism. And if you say something to somebody who happens not to be white, um, you're, you're, you, you basically are, are racist because you, just because that person is not white and you are. So you have to shut up and you can't criticize a person uh, who, who's, not, who's, who's black or Asian. You can't because you're called a racist if you do. Whereas if you're a black person or an Asian person, you can criticize a white person and you can say what you like about them. But uh, because and, and, and even you say something that's completely wrong, it, it's somehow OK because, it's, um, you know, you're just reversing the, the white privilege. Mm -hmm. and, and snobbery is the same, you know, it's, it's snobbery. There's inver inverted snobbery as well. You know, if, if, if you have um, if you're seen to be affluent. You're privileged, so you should just shut up and not talk about, you know, the like our own our own prime minister in Ireland, and um, would be considered a privileged person, um, and people say he shouldn't be commenting on such a thing because he doesn't understand what it's like to be poor. But I don't see why you can't have an opinion on something just because you're wealthy or just because you're white. You know? mm -hmm. And how do you see all these issues kind of coming together? Does it seem like there's sort of like a coalition of people who are, you know, purporting and sort of promulgating things like toxic feminism and ageism and reverse racism. Yeah. You know, I, think there's, I definitely think there's a politically correct agenda, and I think maybe the politically correct agenda is run by people who are using these toxic... These people are being used, and it's often by politicians um, who want to promote a, a socialist... In over here, it's socialist. In America, it's, it's Democrat. Um, they kind of promote it, and they... they I, I just, you know, I, I just noticed that they do... The same people, all, all kind of... The, the inverted racists, the inverted snobs... 
the toxic feminists, they all seem to be in the same groups. They have, they all mix with each other. They almost they have an echo chamber. And if anyone, if anyone dares to to come up against them or criticise them in any way, or if anyone shows any ambiguity, doesn't completely agree with them, and even only agrees a part of what they're saying, they're completely blacklisted by them. You know, they they get really angry on on social media or in you know face to face. You know, and, the, the, and a lot of the media actually would would, would fit into a lot of the media, which of which I'm a part, would be politically correct. And and if you say any, if you say anything that there a few people have stuck stuck their heads out, uh, such as a broadcaster who said that women should be careful, uh, women have some responsibility for their own personal safety. He's immediately branded um, an apologist for rapists because he said that, even though he's anything but. But he he was, and he had to apologise. Um, and he lost his job for a while over it. So it, the politically correct people, they, they, they try to shut down conversation. They, you know, they, they you, you don't agree with them. They, they'll, for example, recently as well, there was a, there was a pro-life march. It was people against, against abortion. And, and the, the, they were told that the hotel, the hotel where these people were going to speak, the staff were told, and they were given death threats apparently, but I, I don't know, I, can't, I haven't checked that out, but they, they said there were death threats to the staff. And also they, they were told that um, the, 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 these politically correct feminists would boycott the hotel and stage protests outside it if these people were allowed to speak. So they, they'd basically shout and yell and shake their fists in the air and stamp in the street and try to shut down intelligent and reasonable conversation you, you can't have you can't have a, a civilized disagreement with them they, they shout when, when you try to speak to them mm-hmm. yeah and it's a really interesting phenomenon it's going on all across the western world we're having that happen yeah in the US. It's not, it definitely it's not just an Irish thing yeah so i mean what do you think is the best way to approach that issue is it something where you can convert the masses to kind of seeing a more libertarian point of view or are they just stuck in their ways yeah, I think they're stuck in. They're probably, some of them are stuck in the ways, but I, I don't think we really will ever get rid of it. I think there will always be people who think like this, and there probably always have been. But um, I, I think the only thing you can do is, is maybe you know have a laugh at it, which I've done in my book, and and you know expose it where you can as well. But I, I, I don't. I often get these people that they attack me on social media, and I don't even bother to answer them because I know it's just going. I'm just going down to repeating myself and going off on side issues, so I, I don't bother really get engaging with them anymore because I, I have done it in the past, and I found that all I do is repeat myself. And I, I, I even try to sometimes I try to concede a point or agree with them, and they take that as a sign of weakness, you know, or they say you're flaky if you don't. I mean, I don't really have rigid views about this either. I, I, I kind of I'm open. To, I'm actually open to persuasion. I'm open to. I, I, I believe I have an open mind. But I, I don't believe, um, I, I do believe that floozies um, are, are, are much maligned, and even though they're not the most likable people, uh, and uh, you know, but I, I, I still think that people shouldn't just make them outcasts just because they're going around stealing husbands and boyfriends and that sort of thing. Maybe the husband and boyfriends want to be stolen. Maybe, you know, no one ever seems to blame. The funny thing is for fem- feminists never seem to blame the men either for going off these women. They blame men for other things. They, they say men are, are naturally... Are, are naturally driven to rape, but they don't say that men are naturally driven to be attracted to these women. You know, they, they never seem to they, they never seem to blame the men when, when they're talking about women who dress like bluesies and women who appeal to the male gaze. You know, they, they just they let the men off on that one. But I I, I, I don't have particularly strong views of my own on it, except to say that I, I wrote this book as a kind of backlash against politically correct, political correctness, and then my characters took over and they developed uh, opinions of their own. Yeah, and that's a very, very interesting way to conclude the interview here. I mean, do you see perhaps floozies being the great uh, sort of secret weapon in the war against politically correct culture? Yeah, I think they're a bit subversive, actually. You know, I mean, I, I you know, I, it's, it's like when you when you, when you find yourself liking someone that you really shouldn't. I mean, that this is I really set out to write when I was writing this. I originally set out to write. I wanted to write a character that no one would like, and I ended up liking liking the main character in the book. But um. I, you know, and it just happened to my views about political, political correctness came into it, but uh, my very fluid views, which change occasionally. But I, 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 I just hope no one is going to confuse me with the characters in my fiction. You know, but um, I, if they do, I can't help it, and you know, it won't. It probably won't do me any harm. <laughs> they do, but I, 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 I don't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not the characters in my fiction. I'm an awful lot nicer than, than some of these women. But at the same time, I like them. But when, when, when I, got, I grew to like them, when I was writing them. All right. We it, want to thank you so it's like much. Having a really, it's like having it's like having a very an awful friend that nobody else likes. <laughs> but as as it turned out, other people did like them, you know, and especially men for some reason. Men seem to enjoy the book more than anyone. Yeah, take it from me. It's a great read. I, I'm a big fan of your work. Well, thanks. All right. Well, once again, I want to thank you so much for taking time to to talk to us today, Geraldine. And just to conclude, do you have any websites or social media networks you want to plug for us? 
Yeah, I have my, my Facebook page. It's just my own name, Jersey Konski, on Facebook. And um, I have one called Random Reporter Online Newspaper on Facebook. And um, I have uh, I have my, my Twitter is Jer Konski on Twitter. And I have a Wix website, which I'm still building. So I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to get I'm going through my archives at the moment, trying to get some some of my old articles together to put them up online. But um, I have so many of them, and you know, and they're still a lot of them are only in paper form. So I'm scanning them all onto PDFs and converting them. So that's what I'm doing. But you can you can find me on Facebook as Jared and Comsey, or you can find me on Twitter as Jared Comsey, or on LinkedIn under my own name as well. And are you working on any upcoming books? Yeah, well, I've a load. I've got a load. I'm, I'm working on it. I've written a follow-up to Wacky Ireland, which is a book. It was, it's, it's a non-fiction book about the wacky side of Irish life. So I've written a follow-up to that, and it's called Wacky Ireland. But I'm, I'm proofreading it, and I've also written a few more novels, um, including one about an affluent girl who finds herself homeless. And I, I wrote this, but I, I have to go over it again. You know, I want to. Um, I, I, I wrote the first draft years ago. I, I haven't looked at it for a few years. I've got a load. I want to write it. I, I have a long list of books. I have ideas for books. And um, I've also I've also written a book about an arrogant man who stalks his ex because he believes she's writing about him. And I provisionally call that you're so vain. And about a woman who's accused of murder. But um, I, I there's a, a real mixture really of everything. But I I, I I originally started off writing to appeal to women, but I, I've noticed since men seem to be my main readers now that I'm, I'll probably I, I might even make one of my main characters. I, I have one of my main characters as a man, but I was thinking toying with changing it to a woman. But I think I'll leave him as a man now because it's fun to write from the male point of view as well. And, uh, yeah, and where can we check out your regular columns and purchase your books? Well, you, you can just check me on that because I'm freelance. I could, I could turn up anywhere, but you can check me. You can find my books on Amazon, and um, they're all on Amazon at the moment. And you can you can find I, I kind of update everything on Facebook. I'm more on, I'm more on Facebook than on Twitter. So if you check me out on Facebook, I, I have um, I have pages for my books, and I have I have a page for some of my journalism and. Um, Otherwise, you can Google me and you'll probably find articles I've written, which, which are some of them more recent than others. All right. But I have the website, but I, have, I haven't sorted. I haven't really, I have to get my archives sorted before I, I finish putting up the website. All right. And on that note, any uh, final word you want to go out on? Just uh, any topic you want to address? Any summary notes you want to bring up? Um, I just think people should be kinder to each other. And, and maybe, I, I think women should be kinder to each other. And then maybe maybe they wouldn't be blaming men all the time because men. I think if women were kinder to, to each other, men men would be as well. But I, I think women should be kinder to men too because I think men get there's an awful lot of man bashing that goes along, and I, I I don't think we're that different really. We have different views on some things, but I, I don't think men are the enemy, and I don't think other women are all the enemy either. Even the toxic feminists, um, I I don't I, you know they can, they they probably are a product of their time as well, you know. So I just think basically everyone should be kinder to each other and have a laugh. You know, if you can't if you can't beat them, laugh at them or laugh with them. Even better. We here at Not Economically Viable would again like to thank Geraldine Comiskey for taking time out of her schedule to talk to us today. If you're interested in checking out Comiskey's work, you can follow her online at Twitter at Ger Comiskey and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Geraldine dot Comiskey dot nine. And of course, you can find and purchase all of Geraldine's books on Amazon. Anyway, that's all we've got for you this installment. As a friendly reminder, all of the Not Economically Viable podcasts are published under a Creative Commons license, so feel free to redistribute and republish all of our interviews wherever you'd like, be it YouTube, other hosting sites, or really, where the hell ever. Hey, they don't call it the free exchange of ideas for nothing, do they? Mm-hmm.